All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to session number seven, Artificial Intelligence and Nanotechnology. My name is Mark Hersom, Professor of Material Science and Engineering here at Northwestern, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Randall Snur and Professor Christopher Wolverton. Randall Snur is the John G. Searle Professor and Department Chair of Chemical and Biological Engineering. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania and PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, both in chemical engineering. He completed a postdoc appointment at the University of Leipzig, supported by a fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation before joining the faculty here at Northwestern. Professor Snur's research focuses on the development of new nanoporous materials to solve important problems in energy and sustainability. This includes the development of materials to store hydrogen and fuel cells, materials for carbon capture and sequestration, highly selective catalysts for green chemistry, and harvesting water from air. He uses powerful molecular modeling and machine learning techniques to achieve these goals. Christopher Wolverton is the Jerome B. Cohen Professor of Material Science and Engineering. He received his undergraduate degree in physics from the UT, from University of Texas at Austin, and his PhD in physics from UC Berkeley. He was a postdoc at National Renewable Energy Lab and a staff scientist there before becoming a senior technical specialist at Ford Research Laboratory and later a technical leader at Ford. He joined us here at Northwestern in 2007, becoming the Jerome B. Cohen Professor of Material Science and Engineering in 2017. Professor Wolverton's research is centered on computational material science, specifically first principles quantum mechanical methods, high throughput, machine learning tools to accelerate materials discovery. His laboratory created the Open Quantum Materials Database, which is one of the largest materials databases in the world, containing properties of more than one million compounds. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage our session seven speakers, Professor Randy Snur and Chris Wolverton. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I see everybody has been having trouble with this today, so I thought I would first, yep, that's why they have trouble, okay. <laughs> All right, how do I get it to go back? Okay, great. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Congratulations, Chad, for the anniversary of IIN, and thanks for uh, inviting us to come speak. So I wanna talk, uh, Randy and I both wanna talk today uh, a little bit about the intersection of AI and nanotechnology and we wanna do this specifically through the lens of discovery of new materials. So there's many uh, ways that AI and, and nanotechnology interact, but this is the specific uh, idea that we're gonna talk about. And you've heard lots of examples already today of you know, exciting new technological advances that were essentially enabled by the discovery of novel materials with exciting new properties. So this is really something that's, uh, that's uh, pervasive uh, and, uh, you know, this, this article appeared in Barron's a few years ago with this very provocative title of technologies that could potentially create trillion dollar markets, and that's trillion with a T. And one of the technologies that they discuss in this is exactly this uh, idea of the discovery of novel materials. The reason why it, it rises to this level is because materials sort of pervade all different types of technologies, right? We've seen already examples today of structural materials where the mechanical properties are of importance, but also functional materials where a variety of different functional properties are of interest. Uh, energy materials we just heard about, uh, catalyst materials, biomaterials, all of these have, you know, sort of uh, unique uh, exciting functions, and almost all of these applications could be improved if we had better materials, right? Okay, so uh, by the way, you're probably maybe wondering if you haven't read this article, what are the other two other than uh, discovery of new materials? And the other two are uh, quantum computing and CRISPR gene editing. So it kind of gives you some sense of, you know, where they put uh, discovery of new materials in that context. Okay, so how do we discover new materials? Why don't we just take the approach of, well, let's just try everything. If we're, if we're looking for a new material that has a specific function, why don't we just try sort of everything we can think of, find the best material, and be done? Okay, 
So if you go through that exercise, uh, probably many of you already are sort of realizing the problem with that, that you very quickly run into this sort of combinatorial explosion of possible new materials. All right, so let's just take a very simple example. Let's just uh, start with the periodic table. I promised I wasn't gonna do that. Oh boy. Okay. I don't know how to go back and I don't know how to use the pointer. All right. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So let's, let's take a, a simple example here. Let's start with the periodic table, and let's just say, let's just choose two elements from the periodic table. So roughly speaking, there's about 100 elements in the periodic table. We're just going to combine two of them to form a compound. Uh, so the number of ways you can do that is just 100 choose two, which is about 5,000. Um, and so you might think, well, 5,000, that doesn't sound so bad, you know, that there's 5,000 possibilities. But of course, then in, in addition, you have to consider how these uh, elements are brought together to form some crystalline structure. So you would need to multiply this by sort of the number of possible different structure types that you might imagine. And roughly speaking, for inorganic crystalline solids, there's about uh, 10,000 of these known uh, inorganic crystal structure types. Okay, so if you go through this kind of combinatorial exercise and just do kind of a back of the envelope calculation, you, you very quickly see that, well, when you bring together two materials, you might have a few million different combinations, but by the time you get to three, four, five component uh, systems, you get up into the very, very large, you know, hundreds of billions of possible combinations. Okay, so it's really then uh, a real, um, you know, needle in the haystack type problem, trying to find a new material out of these billions of possible combinations. So how are we gonna actually uh, make progress with this? Well, data. Data hopefully can help. Uh, and there have been you know, recent progress in both experimental high throughput data uh, uh, collection and also computational data sources that have really enabled uh, a, a data-driven approach. Um, the so-called mega libraries uh, that you've heard about several times today already from uh, uh, Chad's group uh, is an illustration of where they can grow these uh, samples of literally millions of different nanoparticles across a compositional gradient. So you can form, you know, literally millions of different nanoparticles that each have different chemical compositions, right? So this is, a, this is potentially a way of generating very large scale data, uh, at least on the scale of maybe millions uh, of samples. What about, I said ex experimentally, uh, sorry, uh, Computationally as well, so uh, computationally, uh, material science techniques have evolved to the point where with quantum mechanical calculations of, of materials properties, we can uh, essentially predict materials properties on a computer even before they've been made experimentally in the laboratory. Um, so this is nice because computational methods are also sort of very amenable to automated workflows. It's very easy to sort of code uh, computational techniques that actually have an automated workflow. And because of those two uh, properties then, uh, our group and other groups around the world have been collecting large-scale computational data into these large-scale databases of materials properties. So the one at Northwestern is the uh, OQMD, or Open Quantum Materials Database. It's a database of computed materials properties, uh, and it contains about a million uh, inorganic solids in the database. Okay, so we, we basically have this, this status now where we're able to get sort of roughly speaking maybe millions of data points from experiment, maybe millions of data points from computation, so how can we actually make use of that information? Okay, so there's a couple of different ways you might think of going about this. A simple but direct way of doing this is so-called high throughput computational screening. So the idea with computational screening is we might start with uh, a, a set of candidate compounds for a given application that we're interested in. So suppose we're interested in finding a new material that has some specific set of properties. So we, we start by identifying a, a fairly large but manageable set of candidates, and then we just divide, devise a set of, uh, of screening criteria in terms of uh, restrictive properties 
that narrow down the list. Okay, so we start maybe with, uh, if we're looking for a solar cell material, for example, we might start with a large number of candidates and say, well, we want this to be thermodynamically stable or stable in whatever environment it's going to be in. We want it to have a certain band gap. We want it to absorb uh, the way we want and so forth. Those could be the screening properties. And then ultimately, at the end, you would wind up with a smaller set of candidates that satisfy all these properties that you're interested in. Okay. So that's a very powerful way to, to go about this, uh, but like I say, a very uh, simple and direct way. And the problem is it doesn't always work. What if the search space is just too large for that? We can't sort of start with a meaningful set of candidates because the search space that we're interested in searching is just so large. Okay, so if we think about this, what we're, what we're doing in these kind of uh, materials property optimizations is we're essentially saying we want to be able to write a material property for whatever application we're interested in as a function of some features of the material. Okay, so the features of the material are essentially you know, how we describe the material, the things that we think are physically or chemically important about the material. I'll show in the next slide a little bit of example of the types of features that you might use. But ultimately, this is a very simple way of thinking about sort of what we're trying to do. Okay. And the question is, if we have thousands or even millions of these examples of property uh, feature pairs in, in our large-scale databases, could we show those examples to a machine and essentially train a machine to learn this functional relationship F? If we could, this would be fantastic because uh, the features, typically speaking, are very, very trivial to evaluate. So if we could train a machine learning model to sort of learn this function, then we'd sort of transform the idea of instead of trying to find a material that has the magic property, we would just need to optimize with respect to these very, very simple features. Okay. So how do we actually do this? Well, this is the domain where machine learning comes into play because this is exactly what machine learning is good for. Machine learning is good for taking large-scale data sets and identifying correlations within that data set. And this is essentially what we want to do. We want to find the correlations between the property and the features. Okay. So how do we construct a machine learning model? Well, there's essentially uh, a few different elements of that. We need to have data, of course, in the first place to train the machine. Uh, and I've talked already a little bit about that. We need to actually decide on what the features should be for our given material, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then I should mention that the, the third part of this is the, the actual learning part, the algorithmic uh, part, and this is where we actually rely on advances made by our computer science and mathematics uh, colleagues who have really devised a very large set of very powerful algorithms not only that they've devised these algorithms, but in, in many cases, these are freely and publicly available. Uh, and so everybody has access to these kind of state-of-the-art machine learning tools. And then ultimately, if we can train this, uh, this algorithm, then we can wind up with a predictive model and, like I say, optimize with respect to features. Okay, so the last bit of the puzzle is what are these features? Like I say, the features are essentially how we tell the machine what's interesting and what's important about the material. Okay, so a very simple way of thinking about the features is if we have a compound, say, that's composed of three elements, A, B, and C, you might think, well, some features you could use would just be properties of the elements that are going into the compound. So we could just make properties of the elements A, B, and C that actually uh, uh, go into the compound here. Uh, and these could be anything you can think of electronegativity, the size of the atoms, uh, and so forth, all right? But you, you probably immediately see a problem with this is that this doesn't have anything to do with the structure of the compound, and we sort of know that the property structure relationship is typically uh, important. So you might want to include features that have to do something with the, the structure of the compound as well, some things like bond length or local coordination or so forth. But the point of this is just to show you some kind of very simple ideas about the features that you can incorporate. Randy's going to show you an example in just a minute of something that's much more complicated uh, in terms of the features. Okay. All right. So we've kind of assembled all of the, uh, you know, all of the pieces of the methodology to create one of these machine learning models. And now we want to basically spend some time telling you about three examples of where this has been successfully used to actually predict and discover uh, new materials. So I'm going to cover the first example, and then Randy's going to come up and, and talk about the last two. 
All right, so the first example is a, is a case where machine learning actually predicted uh, surprising compositions for what are called bulk metallic glasses. So bulk metallic glasses, for those who are not familiar, are, well, exactly what they sound like. They're metal, they're uh, multi-component compounds that are composed of metals, but they're glassy in, an, uh, in a structural sense. So they have an amorphous structure as opposed to a crystal structure. Uh, and so that's why they're, they're glassy, but they're uh, composed of metals, so metallic glasses. They're interesting to a lot of people because of the fact that they have this amorphous structure. They have some unusual mechanical properties that are very difficult to, uh, to get in crystalline solids. And so people sort of r routinely, there's a, there's a uh, research community that searches for these metallic glasses, and then they're notoriously difficult to find. Uh, they're multi-component, and they don't, uh, they're, they're not very common, essentially. So we thought, well, this is an interesting example of trying to, uh, trying to predict something with machine learning. And I like this example in particular because in this particular case, we didn't actually rely on any of the high-throughput, large-scale databases uh, that I told you about before. We just went to the library. So this is a case where there was data literally sitting on the shelves of mud, uh, that was in handbooks, essentially, of uh, metallic glasses. In this case, the, the handbooks had about 6,800 uh, entries in the database. These were 6,800 times that various experimental groups had tried to produce a metallic glass and either succeeded or failed. The amazing thing about this data set that, that's in a handbook is that the, the uh, handbook actually contains the negative data in addition to the positive data. So the cases where experimentalists succeeded to find a glass are there, but somewhat surprisingly, they actually stored the cases where they tried to form a glass and failed. This is actually very uh, crucial for our training of machine learning to have this negative data. We basically just then took this data, trained a machine learning model of the type that I, uh, I showed you before on a very simple property, just a binary classification. Given a chemical composition, could this form a glass, yes or no? Okay, and we trained it on these uh, entirely on the data from this handbook. And basically then, once we have this model that's trained, now like I say, we can evaluate the features of this model very, very quickly. So we're able to scan over a very large space of 27 million different compositions to search for cases where machine learning is very confident that there should be a glass there. Um, but we were looking specifically for cases that were not compositionally close to any known bulk metallic glasses. Okay, so we, we uh, provided a list of uh, predictions, we published a list of predictions, and some of our experimental colleagues actually uh, contacted us and said, well, this, this one particular system is interesting, this cobalt, zirconium, vanadium system is interesting because nobody's ever seen a glass in that system. And you say machine learning is very confident there should be something there, we don't believe it. So they then synthesized a series of, uh, of cobalt, zirconium, vanadium uh, samples, and I guess you know what's coming next. Um, they found metallic glasses through a, kind of a, a wide swath of composition space in this system. So this is a, a case where just using data that sort of already happened to be in the library, coupled with a machine learning a way to tease out the, the correlations of the data set, we were able to make a surprising prediction that was then experimentally verified. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Randy, and he'll tell you about the second two examples. Yeah, so I'll talk about two, two other examples. Um, the first one's related to nanoporous materials for hydrogen storage for fuel cell vehicles, and the last one is um, about uh, nanoparticles. So um, Will and Omar already talked about um, MOFs, metal organic frameworks. These are nanoporous crystalline materials uh, with pores that are on the order of a nanometer. And they're, they're made in a, a very interesting way from metal nodes, there's a metal node, that are connected by these organic linker molecules. So it's really a, bu a building block approach. And there's an enormous number of these materials that you could make because you can assemble different building blocks and you can assemble them in, in different ways. So um, Chris mostly talked about inorganic compounds. So you know, different metals form these nodes, but then you also introduce all of the diversity of organic chemistry through the linkers. So you can make these different sizes, which affects the pore size. You can introduce all sorts of different chemical functionality. And people are interested in these for a, a wide variety of applications. I'm going to talk about storing gases 
in these little pores, but you can also think about separating gases like Will and Omar talked about, um, making materials that run catalytic, catalytic reactions, uh, even things like drug delivery. And it's, it's again the needle in a haystack. There are you know, millions of potential MOFs. If we have some particular application in mind, how do we find top performing materials for that application? And the application that I'm gonna talk about uh, just, I won't tell, talk much about the application itself, but we're thinking about finding materials that could store hydrogen. If you want to have a vehicle that runs on hydrogen, like with a fuel cell, you want a porous, spongy material that could soak up a lot of hydrogen to store it at, at reasonable pressures. And as Chris said, one way to identify candidates would be high throughput computational screening. So this is something my group has done. We take a large number of candidates, we run some sort of physics-based computer simulation on them to predict their properties and narrow down a list of candidates and our colleagues can go into the lab and actually make them and ultimately you know, we're trying to find something that could be used practically. And on the, the slide I've indicated approximate time scales for doing these things. Um, a computer simulation of one of these materials might take hours or days per material. Um, experiments might take weeks to months, and these are highly variable, you know, depending, occasionally the, the experiments are actually faster than the simulations, but, but these are rough guidelines. So you could imagine, if you have a very large number of candidates, this step starts to become a bottleneck. And as Chris said, one way you can use machine learning is to basically replace these expensive simulations with a very simple model. Um, and so we're, I'll talk about how we could develop such a model. Given some data here, how could we develop a model that could be evaluated in, in seconds or minutes? Um, and as Chris said, you need data, you need these features, and you need these algorithms. And I'll, I'll talk about the features. And, and this is where um, d domain knowledge becomes important, knowing something about the physical system that, that you're working on. So, as Chris said, we were trying to find this function that relates these features to the thing we're interested in. And in our case, the thing we're interested in is how much hydrogen can be stored in one of these materials. So, if we weren't doing machine learning, we would be running physics-based computer simulations, um, a method known as Monte Carlo simulations. And we're trying to predict how much gas goes in this MOF when it's in contact with, with a gas phase. And we generate millions of configurations on the computer. And, and every time we generate one of these configurations, we have to calculate the energy that a hydrogen molecule feels with the framework. And in a very real sense, that's the input to the simulation. And we thought to ourselves, well, we're trying to replace this simulation. So, what goes into the simulation? It's the thing I just told you, the energy that a hydrogen molecule feels at all these locations. We thought, well, maybe we could use that as the, as the features. So the idea was we could take them off crystal structure, put a hydrogen molecule at all of these locations, calculate the energy it feels. We can do that very quickly in minutes. And then make a, a histogram. How often do you find a particular energy? And this histogram then could be the, the features, the, the fingerprint that tells you how is one MOF different from another one. So, so we did this. We had data for about 1,000 MOFs where we had run the more expensive simulation. And now we're trying to get this function that Chris talked about, the function that relates this histogram, these features, with how much hydrogen is stored in the material. And, um, these are supposed to be TED-style talks, and I'm probably not supposed to show you an equation, but I'm going to show you one anyway. Um, and my purpose in showing it to you is just to show you how simple it is. So here's the equation. Um, the, the x's here are the heights of these bars. So if you have a new MOF, we can calculate this very quickly. That gives you the x's. And these coefficients, that's what we trained. That was the machine learning. And the machine learning algorithm we're using here is just linear regression, which is a very simple correlation. And kind of the point here is 
because we fed so much physics into the descriptors, the, the algorithm is quite simple. On the other hand, with very simple features, you might need a more complicated machine learning algorithm, something like a neural network, which is more of a black box. You don't know what's going on inside. So um, how does it work? Um, here are the predictions from the machine learning as a function of the more expensive physics-based simulations. And you can see it's reasonably good. We can identify the top performing materials. So we, we went ahead and used this. We looked at a set of 50,000 existing MOFs. And instead of running 50,000 Monte Carlo simulations, we just ran the machine learning model, which is very quick. Um, we actually ran some simulations then just to test things, but we ultimately narrowed down a list of the top candidates, and we went and talked with Omar Farha and his group, and this was one of the top candidates. They thought, this looks like an interesting material. We'd, we'd like to make this. It was a known material. Another group had already made it, but they had never looked at it for this application. So Omar and his team went into the lab, made the material, did the kind of standard characterization, and measured how much hydrogen does it take up. So this is the amount of hydrogen in the material as a function of pressure. And you're looking here at a comparison of the experiments and these Monte Carlo simulations, the prediction from uh, the computation, which was done before anyone set foot in the lab. And you can see there's reasonably good agreement here. And, oh, OK. My, my table is all screwed up here. I'll tell you what it says. Um, the table has a list of the top materials from the literature for storing hydrogen. And it's cut off, but the value for our material, within the error bars of the experiment, it's as good as anything out there. And we were able to identify it very rapidly because of this combination of machine learning, molecular simulation, and an experiment. So this was one way to use machine learning. We, we, we used it to bypass these expensive computer simulations. But if you think about what we did, in some ways, it, maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do. It was sort of brute force. We looked at all of the candidates in this library of MOFs. And in our case, there were 50,000. So that was quite doable. But if we think about the, the mega libraries from Chad Merkin, there are hundreds of millions of possibilities there. And even running the machine learning maybe starts to become a bit of a bottleneck. So there's another way you can apply machine learning. And that is you start off with some candidates, but the, the computer tells you which ones should you look at next. So I'll describe briefly how this works. Um, and I'll, tell, I'll talk about it in the context of these mega libraries. So there are hundreds of millions of potential nanoparticles that you could synthesize. And if you wanted to find the top ones for something like a catalytic reaction, you know, how would you do that? So on one slide, I'm going to tell you about something called Bayesian optimization. So this is a method that answers this question of how do you choose the next thing to look at? And the idea is you start off with a few data points, the x's. Maybe you don't have very many. No matter. You go ahead and fit a model to it anyway. Maybe you get the blue line. Now, with that model, you could use it and say, well, what does the model predict are the top materials? And so that'd be one thing you want to do, find those top materials. But at the same time, it's probably not a very good model because you don't have very many data points. So Bayesian optimization balances the need between trying to find the best material and kind of systematically picking a few data points that will help you improve the model. So um, Chad Merkin and his team applied this to nanoparticles. And um, in this initial work, they didn't go after um, a catalytic reaction. Instead, they went after looking for um, a targeted structural motif. And what they wanted were nanoparticles that have two phases. So let's look at this nanoparticle. You can see there's a, a blue phase here that has one composition. And there's this tan phase that has another composition. And they wanted nanoparticles that had two phases and a single interface. That, that motif is interesting for a number of, of applications. And they looked at nanoparticles that had any of these eight um, 
elements, any of these eight metals. And they started with 148 compositions from their, the previous work. And if you were one of the students who did all of this, you probably are thinking, that's a lot of data, a lot of work. But in the context of 100 million candidates, it's a very little amount of data. So they applied this, this Bayesian optimization in, in this paper that's cited here. And they say this was like a four-week campaign. And they went through three rounds. And in each round, the computer suggested new compositions to look at. They made these materials. They characterized them with transmission electron microscopy. And based on that, then, the computer suggested some new ones and, and a third round. And as they went through this, the computer is suggesting in increasingly complex uh, compositions. So the, the Bayesian optimization suggested um, previously unidentified nanoparticle compositions with this desired interfacial motif. And this feedback then between synthesis and machine learning resulted in um, 18 new nanoparticles that in their words were too complex to discover by chemical intuition alone because there's so many elements involved in them. It's not just say two, two metals or three. And they were able to synthesize the most chemically complex single interface metallic nanoparticle ever prepared. So um, to, to wrap this up, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in discovering new materials in nanotechnology and, and other areas, I think, holds uh, tremendous promise. And th this field is still quite young. Um, new algorithms are still coming out. We're still sort of figuring out how to do some of these things. Um, what, what are the limitations? What are the opportunities, things we haven't thought of yet? And I'll, I'll leave you with one final thought. Um, Chris talked about um, sharing of data. His group has this big database. My group has a database of MOFs. And um, these machine learning algorithms, as Chris said, um, people are discovering new algorithms, and they don't just write it up in some scientific journal. They put these into user-friendly software packages that are available online, and people can go and use them. And I think this sort of open source software and this sharing of data are, are really game changers. Um, I was a graduate student in the early 1990s. I spent a lot of time writing computer code. And um, partly because we were doing new things and you had to write the code, but also because just codes weren't available. You know, maybe you had something you shared with a few friends, but there wasn't the infrastructure to do it. And there wasn't the, the mindset um, people sort of held on to things. And that's been a huge change. People develop new software. They put it out on the web. Anyone can use it. The same with data. And I think this confluence of open source software, sharing of data, machine learning algorithms, advances in material synthesis through nanotechnology, characterization, all of these things are going to tremendously accelerate the discovery of new materials for all of the difficult problems that we've been hearing about uh, throughout the day. So I will stop there, and Chris and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay. We're ready for questions? Yeah, we have one right here. Well, the talk. A uh, question for Chris, but maybe Randy, you have thoughts on this also. In in the discovery of this uh, uh, metallic glass that that no one had looked at before, um, can can these big data approaches then also, by virtue of how they're optimized or what coefficients get weighted in certain ways, um, suggest why something has the property of interest such that you could then design more? You know, through through a, uh, you know, like a combine a more rational design along with the, the the large data approaches. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if my mic is on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let me rephrase the question a little bit and say that you're basically asking about sort of you know, can we learn physics and chemistry from these models rather than just be predictive? 
Um, so this is a big question, and certainly, you know, uh, you know, Randy showed you an example of an interpretable model, at least that so we know w at least what features correlate well with the with the property of interest. Um, but but I would say a couple of things that that I'm always a little bit cautious about that because sort of machine learning is really good at identifying correlations, and we know correlation is not causation. So you can easily trap yourself into thinking, you know, making that mistake. Um, but, but it's a very active field of kind of, you know, physics-inspired machine learning models and trying to sort of tease out actual theoretical understanding from these things. Uh, you know, so I, I guess I would give a sort of a moderate yes uh, answer to your question. It's a really challenging problem, um, but yeah, but my, my uh, caution is this correlation causation thing. Okay, go ahead. Chad. Yeah, that was great. Um, Look, there's been a lot of uh, news about AlphaFold, right, and and what they've done, which is you know pretty extraordinary to, to basically crack the uh, the protein folding problem with with machine learning. And you know, it's it's not just PR. I mean, if you talk to the biologists, they'll say they're they're now using it. They rely on it. It it works. Um, could you comment on the relative difficulty of doing that here? Because that's effectively what we're trying to do, right? So, so, so we, we're trying to take you know, the protein folding problem and, and up the game a little bit and be able to predict materials properties. Where is it going to be really challenging? Where do you see a more direct route? Um, how far can this go in your estimation? I'm well, asking you to look into a crystal ball. Yeah, I'm not going to look into a crystal ball, but I'll, you but can I'll do say that, that, Chris. that I think that there's sort of always two fundamental challenges in any of these kind of things. And it's going to sound a little bit trivial, but one is the data. So you have to have enough data to actually build a, a reasonable model. Um, and, you know, hopefully with the mega libraries, that's a solvable problem at least. But it's, it, nevertheless, it's always going to be out there uh, as an issue. But then really the critical thing is this feature engineering or sometimes what I call building the representation part. Um, you know, that's a, that's a fundamental challenge to building these models. And in my opinion, that's where I see really big steps forward is when somebody comes up with a new and better representation for these models, that's when suddenly they get better. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, ultimately the big challenge. It's hard for me to predict exactly how hard that's going to be compared to, you know, the protein folding. But... That's my opinion. Okay, Vinayak. <laughs> so very fascinating, both of you. Thank you. My question is about the temporal scale. Is there a, what's the strategy to incorporate quench rate and TTT and those kinds of issues? And then how about the complete microstructure? Is that something in the future? Okay, I was going to let Randy an answer this. Well, that's much more of a material <laughs> science <laughs> right. question. Um, well, there, so there are already people that are working on machine learning of microstructural features. So that's already, you know, in the works, I would say. It's complicated, and I don't want to sound like I'm saying the same thing, but building the representation is key. Like, what features of the microstructure are actually important to describe whatever you're looking at? Um, for kinetics and TTT, uh, that's complicated. I guess I would say it's... A, maybe data is going to be the bottleneck there. You have to have a lot of data to train these things, and I don't know if we have it. For steels, we have a lot of TTT diagrams, but for everything else, I don't know. In, in the area of porous materials, there's been some work thinking about um, trying to predict rates of diffusion of molecules through these pores, and, and that's something that I think would be amenable to, to using uh, machine learning. Yeah. Okay, we have a question in the back. I Hi, super interesting. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, I'm curious how often these algorithms spit out a material that's either not synthetically accessible or that's prohibited, prohibitively expensive, and are there ways to code for like synthetic ease and uh, price, essentially, in these algorithms? Well, that's something we've thought about a lot. Um, the, the answer is fairly often, um, and it's partly because of you know, what we've looked at, we've said, okay, we're going to target, say, hydrogen storage. Um, we're, there's the potential to add in other objective functions. Um, what we often do is we go with our list of candidates to Omar, 
Omar Farha, and we just sit down together and look through the list. And some of them he looks at and says, well, that would be really hard to make. And we just say, okay, we'll move on. Um, other ones, you know, he says, oh, we've we already made it, or, you know, we can make it easily. Occasionally, what's also maybe even more interesting, he'll look at one of our candidates and he'll say, that would be hard to make. But if you changed it a little bit, that's something we could make. And so, you know, there's like a lot of things in science, there are all these iterations. It's rarely this sort of, you know, pipeline from one thing to the next. Maybe I could say one thing in response to that, that I think this is a good illustration of the negative data issue as well, that we, we initially tried to train machine learning models of synthesizability, to train machine learning to recognize when a compound is going to be synthesizable in the lab and when it's not. Now, if you imagine training only on experimental data, by definition, everything is synthesizable. So the machine learns very quickly, aha, everything is synthesizable, and it predicts everything is synthesizable. So this is really a case where negative data is actually crucial. Okay, and this will be our final question. Uh, this is kind of piggybacking off of the AlphaFold question. My background, or PhD was in nano, and then now I work in bioinformatics. Uh, but your pipeline that you showed is almost the exact same as many bioinformatics pipelines. AlphaFold, you, gener you have your input, then you generate it into MSA, that's your feature set, and then you run it through the ML algorithm, and then same for drug discovery, this parallels many drug discovery pipelines. Uh, do you see the field of nanotech or computational materials discovery paralyzing somewhat what bioinformatics has turned into? In, in what way? Where you get, you, it's more democratized now. So at the beginning it was just ML people or scientists were only able to access it. But then over time, you got simplified algorithms that other people were able to access to make large pipelines so you could have somebody that maybe doesn't have a ton of training in the field, but still discovering new drugs or doing new things within the field. I mean, I see that starting to happen. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these machine learning algorithms, the kind of the guts of it, it's all open source software. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a very positive development. Yeah, maybe I could just say one thing kind of in response to you and Chad too that so I you know I made this point that the that the second step in the workflow is really the critical part for us. I think in some ways this is because of the size of our data sets typically is not so large. So right now we're just not good enough at feature engineering so that we're exposing the machine learning algorithm as the bottleneck. But you could imagine if we get better at that or if we start to get really large data sets uh, we might actually get to the point where the, the algorithmic part is actually exposed as, a, as problematic as well. The, the other big difference is, I mean, protein folding, that's a very narrow thing. Chad's basically asking, how can we discover, you know, every other kind of material? <laughs> it's a very diverse area. Um, and so just the amount of resources, you know, the amount of resources on protein folding is immense. Th these other resources are spread over many classes of materials. Okay, I think we're gonna have to stop the discussion there. Let's thank Chris and Randy again. And we will now move into break. We'll reconvene at 355.